Hi, I'm Jack Sanderlin, and I'm the Head Prefect of Auckland Grammar School in 2021. My job here today is to give you some key information about Careers Evening, which is happening at Auckland Grammar School on Tuesday, the 15th of June, from 6 to 9 p.m. In the midst of new challenges, we must continue to encourage our students to remain determined, focused, and to flex for their future. To move forward successfully, they will need to flex all their dimensions, specifically the mental, social, physical, and spiritual aspects of well-being. They will also need to be well-informed to make decisions about their career and transition beyond high school. This year, we have 70 presenters from across our New Zealand universities, tertiary providers and industry presenters who work in various fields. For example, not only will you hear from an academic presenter about studying law, medicine, or starting your apprenticeship, you will also hear from people who work in the industry or profession itself. The first session starts at 6.30 p.m. Also new is our Next Steps resource that will be available to all students. The rationale behind this resource is that sometimes it is hard for students to make informed decisions. So this handy guide will be able to signpost students throughout the process and give some question prompts for each session. Lastly, please ensure that you turn up in full school uniform. My name is Kamala Chong and I'm the Head Prefect at St Cuthbert's College. It gives me pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker this afternoon, Miss Kate Morton. Kate Morton is an old girl of St Cuthbert's College, class of 99, and founder of the Transformation Space. Kate is a transformational leader with an extensive background in corporate marketing, sales and leadership. She is the founder of the Transformation Space, an executive coaching and training business. Transformational leadership is her passion. For many years of ex executive lead level leadership experience, Kate has experienced firsthand how significant leadership is on delivering both results and creating business culture and how growing people's self-awareness improves self-confidence, increases satisfaction, and lowers stress. Kate is one of the rare class of executive coaches who has deep commercial and strategic experience. Through many years in sales leadership roles within the FMCG industry in Australia, the US, and New Zealand, in her most recent corporate role, she led a team of over 200 people in New Zealand. Her approach to delivering strong results has always focused on three key factors, growing high performing people and teams in a highly engaging culture with a clear and powerful strategy. Through executive coaching and training, Kate has helped accelerate people's leadership potential and therefore their impact on people, culture and results. Please join with me as we welcome Kate Morton to the lectern. Thank you very much, Carmel, for those kind words. And it's great to be here and supporting you all on your journey. And to do that, I want to uh, tell you a, a story. And this is a story about uh, careers and it's a story about life. And I think as much as sometimes we'd like the two things to be separate, actually, they're, they're very much interwoven. And this is a picture that's probably about 10 years old now, but um, First, what I want to do is take you back in my life uh, about three years ago, and my life was looking pretty much perfect from the outside. I was happily married um, to a kind and successful man, and I had two healthy children, which is something I'd always dreamed of having, um, a house in central Auckland, which I think is a, a major achievement in anyone's lives these days, um, a wonderful, caring, supportive family, um, big extended family, and I had a great job at a company that I'd been with for over 14 years, a company that I loved, and great prospects in that company. There were just two hitches. I was very unhappy, and I was very unwell. But before we go into that, I want to go back to where you guys are at now. So when I was uh, 17, or actually kind of 16, leaving school, I just had two career objectives. And one was that I wanted to be the boss, I didn't really care of what, just wanted to be the boss. And that had been an objective probably since I was, or my brother would say probably since I was about three. And I wanted to be in business. 
I didn't know what kind of business, I didn't have any industry aspirations or anything like that, but I just wanted to be in business. I also knew that I wanted to ski, I really loved skiing and school had kind of gotten in the way of skiing a little bit. And I wanted to do it all really fast. I was in a hurry and so I actually left school at the end of sixth form. I, I kind of got to the point where I felt like I wanted my life to move on and I, I wanted to be an adult. So at the end of sixth form I made my decision to go to university and uh, my criteria were very clear. I wanted somewhere I could do a commerce degree and somewhere I could ski. So the University of Canterbury was it that delivered this for me and I had a great time. I skied a lot. I got my BCom. I did reasonably well um, and in three years I got in and out of there as fast as I could because I, I wanted to get on with things. So I'd, I'd been 20 for two months when I left and yeah, I was uh, ready to do the next thing but I had done a lot of skiing and actually I thought, actually I want to do some more and so I thought, oh, you know, I'm really ambitious and I've got some big plans for my career but what I really want, I need to get the skiing out of my system because I just want, I really just want to ski. So the first thing I did was I um, went to Canada and I did a ski season and I had the most amazing time. Um, you know, I met people that I'm still friends with now. I worked three part-time jobs doing things that were really average. I think I was paid minimum wage. That was fine. It was enough to get me a season pass at the mountain that I wanted to ski at and, and just have a great time. And actually, I learned a lot about myself in that time and working jobs that, you know, are pretty meaningless. But, you know, you get to learn a little bit about what you like and what you don't like and what you're good at and what you're not so good at. So, you know, there was a lot of benefit in this time for me. But once I'd done my ski season, you know, it was time for my career. And at that time, it was the done thing to do your OE in London. So I was off to the United Kingdom, so off to London. And I had big ambitions. I thought this was going to be my, my time. And so I applied for a lot of jobs. And it was a very frustrating time because what ended up happening is I would apply for these amazing jobs. I think I'm very much, you know, I should be there or thereabouts and I would get down to the final two. And what would happen is every time they would choose the English person over me. You know, I was, I was fundamentally fresh out of university. I didn't have any business experience. Probably had some, you know, capabilities that shone through which got me to those final two, but I, I didn't get there. I never got there. It was a very frustrating time. And of course I had to, I had to be earning some money, so I was doing temp jobs along the way. And at this one job I was working at, I was working for Transport for London, I have no idea what I was actually doing, but it was the most boring job in the world. And I was sitting there, I, I, I really had nothing to do. And I said to the people who I was working for, I said, I don't, I don't have enough work. And they said, shh, don't tell anyone, otherwise we'll lose your, the budget to have you. And I'm thinking, you don't even need me. Anyway, this was the very early days of the internet. So I was spending quite a bit of time surfing the internet and uh, also the early days of Seek. And because I was had a lot of time and I was surfing around, I found a graduate program that was based in Sydney for an advertising agency. And I thought, well, you know, I may as well apply for this. I'm not getting anywhere in, in England. And it was a lengthy application process, and, but I had all the time in the world. So I put my heart and soul into this application and sent it off and kind of never really thought too much about it. Then I decided that it was time to uh, to move back to Auckland. I thought, you know, I've, I've given this London thing a good go and actually I didn't really even like living in London that much. And so came back to Auckland and I've probably been back for about a day when I got a phone call saying, would you like to come for an interview in Sydney? So I'd never been to Australia. Off I went, I uh, thought it was pretty amazing and fronted up to this interview and found out that I was uh, being interviewed. I was, I think over 2000 people had applied for that, though, that graduate program and amazingly I got selected for it. So. It was at an advertising agency called um, DDB and I took that position and did their graduate program and then worked for them for a couple of years. And it was an amazing experience and it's such a great way to start off your career as in, in one of these graduate programs it was for me anyway. And I learned all the different disciplines of advertising. Um, but I got to the point after a couple of years where I thought actually, you know, advertising is great, but it's just kind of one thing in the spectrum of, of marketing. And so I really wanted to go client side and learn a bit, a bit more about that. So at the time I, um, I was looking at two companies and one was Nestle 
and the other one was Wrigley, the chewing gum company. And Nestle, everyone said, well, it's a no-brainer. You know, Nestle is one of the biggest companies in the world. You have to go and work there. And I thought, yeah, it, it sort of seems obvious, but there was something about Wrigley that really drew me in. And there were two things. One was the person who was hiring the role was, he was the marketing director and he was a Yale graduate. He was an American guy that had come out from the States for a couple of years. And he was the most amazing person. I thought, you know, to work for someone like that, you know, that could really impact your career. And it did. Working for him was absolutely incredible. And the other thing was I felt like if I went to work for Nestle, I, I could be a bit of a cog in the wheel. And I thought a smaller company like Wrigley, actually I could get the opportunity to really impact the company every day. And and I, I did. I felt like that for, for a long time. So I was living in Sydney. I was absolutely loving being there and, um, and loving my marketing um, experiences that I was getting. And then my marketing director went back to the States and he, uh, he offered me a job back in, over in Chicago. So this was Wrigley. Wrigley was then part of the, um, but became, bought, was bought out by Mars Incorporated, so another big, uh, big family, uh, fat, privately owned family business, American family business, amazing company. And so off I went to Chicago. And I thought, you know, I was 25, I'd had this, you know, London experience that had failed. I still had big ambitions, you know, I wanted to travel the world and I was super excited about this. I snapped up this opportunity and I got there. The guy who I'd worked for, he left and I ended up in this organisation with no real sponsor in the organisation. It was a terrible, logistically, they had just not, not organised it well at all. I didn't end up getting paid for three months for, because of social security complexities. And the whole thing just turned into a complete disaster. I was doing, I was doing work that was way below the level that I was qualified to do. And what had, what had really happened is that I hadn't done my due diligence. I just thought, great job in America, off we go. And in the end, after about six months, I left. And it felt like a real disaster. It felt like I'd really failed. So I was back to Australia. I did a short stopover in Auckland and determined I definitely did not want to be here and, and I wanted to be back in Sydney. And I took a contract role back at Wrigley. And, and at the time, there was a philosophy in the business that if you wanted to be a marketing director, and that was my kind of predetermined path to general management, or so I thought at the time, that, I, that you needed to do some time in sales. And I thought, you know, my, uh, the executive team were talking to me about, well, this is probably the time. And I thought, okay, this is probably the time. I was very reluctant. In fact, probably reluctant is too soft a word. I did not want to do any time in sales. I did not see myself as a salesperson. I was a marketer and that was the end of it. Anyway, I, I, I said, if the job comes up in the Woolworths team, and Woolworths is the biggest grocery customer in Australia, if a job comes up in that team, I'll take it. And as luck would have it, a job came up the very next week. And so I started on my one year in sales. And four or five months after I started, there was a, a head of the team and another person in the team working alongside me. And both of those people left. And so I ended up have, having no sales experience whatsoever, running the biggest account in the business, um, about a quarter of the business's revenue, no idea what I was doing and it was one of those classic experiences where you either sink or swim and I have to say I very nearly sunk and I just scraped my way into um, swimming and eventually they, they looked for a manager for me for a couple of a couple good good few months and eventually they said well to be honest you're doing the job so you may as well have it. So suddenly I'd ended up in this very senior sales position, it was probably the most senior um, position outside of the executive, and running the, the biggest customer in the business with no real idea what I was doing, but somehow managing to do it and winging it along the way. And after a few years I said, okay, well, I think it's time for me to go back to marketing now. And they said, actually, we've got a different idea for you. And they created another job, which was actually running Coles and Woolworths, so Coles is the second biggest grocery customer in Australia, so over half of the business's revenue. 
So it was too good an opportunity to turn down. Here I was, my you know, thinking I'm a marketer, but it's probably spending more time in sales. And and it started to become a big leadership experience because I had about eight people in my team and a big influence over the sales organisation in Australia. So, you know, a job and it was a job that I didn't want to do, but it became a great experience in developing people and yeah. Anyway, I'd always said that, it, that I was interested in coming back to New Zealand and I thought that was probably many years away. There was a, a job running Wrigley New Zealand that was available, but I thought it was a few years away and then suddenly it was there and I was offered the job and, and within a week I was commuting between Auckland and Sydney. And this was coming into a, a business in New Zealand that was uh, about 30 people in the business and the business was in a dire situation. It was, um, it had been declining for many years, really low morale in the team, so a really big challenge and, and it was an amazing experience for me and my leadership and I, I put everything I had into that role and turned the business around, turned the team around and you know the people that were in the team at the time, you know, everyone still talks about what a time it was, it was so amazing. After that I went on to be part of Mars Incorporated, so um, we merged the two businesses together in New Zealand and I was the sales director for Mars, so 200 people in that team. So this experience in sales, you know, went from one year to many, many and delivered me these amazing experiences that I would never have had in marketing, you know, these incredible leadership experiences because of the number of people that I had. But the other thing that happened around the same time, you know, this was my early 30s and I got married and I had two children and I'd always worked so hard and what I'd done is I'd worked hard in the weeks and I'd recovered in the weekends, you know, that was kind of my mode of operation. And then suddenly when you have children you realise you don't have a weekend, you have no time to yourself and, and I, suddenly I had no time at all to recover. And I'd always expected I'd be a working mother, but what I probably didn't realise is how challenging that actually was or is. And it was kind of manageable when, when I had one child, but when I had an, another child, he, when I went back to work, he didn't sleep for three or four hours almost every night, and I've never worked harder as I was in, in that particular moment. And it was very challenging, and something kind of had to give. And so, you know, I think you look, could look at my life at that moment and say, well, it looked perfect from the outside. You know, I pretty much had everything and I had everything that I'd ever wanted. You know, I had the career I wanted, I had the family I wanted, but actually there was so much more that was going on for me beneath the surface. I was tired. I was so intensely tired that no words will ever communicate it. You know, there was no recovery time and always needed my recovery time and I just didn't have it. And when I think back now, I think, you know, I was probably on the spectrum of burnout for, for probably 10 years and having kids just sent me right down, right down the bottom of it. I was becoming a bit disillusioned, you know, I was giving a lot of myself to the corporate world and, and not enough of myself to my family and that was my priority. And I had terrible performance anxiety. I was going into work every day. I don't think I ever took a full breath when I was at work. I was so focused on, you know, am I good enough? I'm not good enough. I didn't do this well enough. I could have done that better. Wait till they find out all the things that I'm not good at, you know, and this voice in my head just went around and around and around. And in the end, I don't think it was the, it wasn't necessarily the long hours or the intensity of the work that caused me to get to burnout. I think it was what was going on in my head and the stress and anxiety that was caused, that was, that, that was causing. It was just, you know, this thing that sits on your shoulders telling you, not good enough, not good enough, work harder, work harder. And I'd always been a perfectionist and in some ways I thought, well, the perfectionism probably accounts for my success because I always do things you know, the, the best that I think is possible. But when I reflect back now, I know it wasn't the perfectionism. It was all the other things that make me good at what I do that counted for my success. What the perfectionism did is it turned me into someone who was constantly anxious because I thought I could always do better. And I could have done better, you know, if there weren't only 24 hours in a day and other things in my life taking away my time. 
I also, yeah, suffered from this, this, this huge lack of confidence. You know, I just didn't believe in myself. I, I always received amazing feedback, but it was like Teflon. You know, I just couldn't receive it. I couldn't hear it. All I could hear was the, the stuff that was going on in my head that was so dominating to my existence. I was not enjoying my kids, you know, I was thinking, my God, they take up so much energy and I just don't have energy. And, and on some level that was killing me because that was my priority, you know, I always wanted to have a children and a family and I wasn't, I wasn't being the, the mother that I wanted to be. And I started to have a little niggle as well on purpose. So I've given 14 years of my life to this company. I've poured my heart and soul into this organization I've, uh, for selling pet food, chocolate, chewing gum. And is that really what I wanted to be doing for the next 14 years? Yes, it was an amazing company and I absolutely loved it. But is there more? You know, is there something more that I could give to the world? And so in the end, I left Mars. I've been there just over 14 years and it was the hardest decision that I, that I ever made. It was like leaving your family. Um, and you know, leaving everything I thought I'd always wanted. So I left Mars, and I left without a dream. You know, often people leave the corporate world, and they leave it with, I'm, you know, I'm done with this, but I'm going to do this. And that was not my story at all. I was leaving Mars because I was absolutely exhausted, and I needed to resolve my health. I needed to re return to my health. But what happened in that time? I, I really basically spent the next year pretty much in bed. I, I sort of did the bare minimum to keep my kids alive, but, um, but my focus was on my health and my recovery. But what emerged from that space was actually passion because I found, you know, I'm sitting around, I'm reading a lot, I'm, you know, looking at a lot of articles on, on the, online, on LinkedIn, and I found that what I was being drawn to was very consistent. I was drawn to anything about people. I was drawn to psychology, I was drawn to neuroscience, culture and leadership. And I realized, you know, this is where this is where my passion is. I've always loved this aspect of my job. Yes, I've really enjoyed the commerciality and the strategy behind it as well, but actually it's the people that have made the most, you know, have me, left me feeling the most rewarded of all the things that I've done in my career. And so I retrained, you know, as Greg said, you'll be five times. Well, this is my second retraining. And I, um, I did a certificate in executive coaching that, that um, took me a year. And so 18 months after I left Mars, I set up the transformation space. So this is my business doing executive coaching, training and leadership. Um, and it was interesting because a year prior to setting it up, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd embarked on this training, but I hadn't thought I would actually become an executive coach. I thought, this is really interesting and I want to learn more about it, but I don't want to necessarily do it. But you know, what had happened in that time is that I'd really had to face into my anxiety, my perfectionism and my lack of confidence. And these are things that you don't want to face into. But if you want to coach other people, you have to overcome your own rubbish. And this was my, you know, this was my rubbish. This was the monkey on my back. And I had to face into it. And I have to say, doing that work was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I had to face into all the, the stories that I had about myself and all the emotions that came with that. But my, I, I'd learned so much. And when I emerged out the other side, although I say this is work that I'll always do, it's always, you know, my personal development, it's amazing because the voice is gone. You know, the voice doesn't say you're not good enough. The voice doesn't say you can't do this. The voice says you're really good at this and you're really good at that and you're not so good at that and that's fine. You're not everything, you're not perfect and that's totally wonderful. So suddenly I realized, you know, this work is actually really important and this is transformational for people. You know, I experienced my own transformation and I now have the opportunity to transform other people's lives. And so that's what I'm doing in this organisation and it's, um, it's incredibly rewarding work. And, you know, when I think about the future and, and what happens, you know, in a world of AI, people still exist and humanity still exists. And where things go wrong in organisations, this is where the, it is generally between people and it's in leadership and it's in relationships and collaboration. And when you can get these things working, 
business results are better, culture is better, people are happier. So for me, you know, really powerful stuff. And, you know, I, I thought I knew what I wanted to do when I was leaving school, but actually, you know, now 20 years later, more, uh, now I've found what I'm really passionate about. And, you know, maybe in 10 years time it changes, but um, it took this long, but that doesn't negate any of the things that I did along the way, which were really important to getting me to this space. So a few of the learnings that I wanted to share with you guys as you embark on making decisions and, and taking your first steps. The first thing I'd say is there's so much value in all experiences and actually some of my, my best learnings came from my worst experiences. So the experience in London, my experience in Chicago, and actually, you know, all the sales experience that I, that I ended up with that I never specifically wanted, that's actually where, how I got to where I am today. And so you just never know, you know, what is the stepping stone? What, what, where things are going to take you? And, and taking those steps and finding out is so important. You have no idea what the outcomes are. But opportunities are put in front of you all the time, and I would say take them. The next thing is that failure isn't final and you know and I, you could look at my career path and say it's been a wonderful career but I've failed along the way absolutely and yeah I would say it's just not final but neither is success you know equally you say there are times when I was really successful but everything changes it's just a journey it's an ongoing journey you just stay with the journey and know that nothing is really ever final it's just an ongoing journey that has twists and roundabouts and you know all sorts of things along the way but it's you know it's how you show up to those things and what you take from them that's really important. What lights you up? Do what you love um, you know even if you love something that's really unusual I'm amazed these days by where you know how people make money and what what sort of things what sort of jobs can be created from passions and when I think about the, the things that um, you know, particularly, you know, law is a classic example. It was very um, popular in my generation to, to do law degrees. And then 10 years later, everyone's 30 and saying, I hate being a lawyer. It's because they didn't like them up, you know, but there were also people who were like, I love being a lawyer and it's amazing. Of course, the people who didn't like it have gone on to do other things. So there was value in their experience, but just follow what you love. You know, you just never know where it's going to lead. And particularly these days where the jobs in 10 years time, you know, they don't even exist today. So follow it, see where it goes. Might not go anywhere, but you'll get experiences along the way that are so valuable. Careers and life stages. So when I was um, advised by my careers uh, people when I was leaving school, the big thing at that time was you're going to have 10 different careers in your life and you know of course that that's true that is true and you know however many more I'm sure that I've already had four but what people didn't talk about is is life stage you know when you're 17 18 you know things are important to you when you're 27 those things are quite different when you're 37 it's quite different again and so leaving space for your life to unfold is so important I'm sure that when you're 47, 57, you know, your life is evolving again and you just don't know what that's going to look like. You can't imagine yourself in 10 years' time. So leave space for, for possibilities and leave space for things emerge. You're going to become a different person and, and, and let that be. Don't predetermine the outcome. Work for a great company and work for great people. So I worked for a great company for a long time and what was great about them was that they cared deeply about their people. I always felt cared for, I always felt like I was, I was looked after and I was important. And I worked for amazing people. I worked for some average people too, but man, I worked for some absolutely phenomenal people and they, you know, what you can get in a year working for an amazing leader is like three years with anyone else. Um, when you're interviewing for people, make sure you're interviewing your managers. You want to find out who you're working for and are they someone who's really going to motivate you and inspire you and, and you know, give you something that's going to help you grow. So find great people. They're out there and they're, you know, they're amazing. They'll transform your career. Money, money, money. Never do something for the money. You'll end up rich and sad. Um, it's, you know, it is a thing. Um, if you're wonderful at something, you will find that the money comes. And finally, I want to talk about the, the importance of health and mental health. And I appreciate that at 17, 18, you know, your health is kind of a given. You know, this is the benefit of youth. But 
Health is the foundation of your life. And I know this firsthand because I didn't have my health. And I knew that I could not have a good life without having my health. And so I gave up everything to get it back and I will never regret that because the way I feel today is just amazing. I can live, I can have a great life and without my health, I, I could never have that. Um, so just keep in mind, this is the, just the kind of the foundation of your life. And then the other thing is your mental health. And equally, I didn't have that because I had this anxiety that I carried around with me. And I would say if you have this, the, the most challenging step, I think, in mental health is acknowledging to yourself that there's an issue. And once I'd acknowledged to myself how deep this issue was, I was then able to take the next step, which was acknowledging it to someone else and getting help. And without that monkey on my shoulder saying this, you know, how bad I am, my life is completely different. So there is amazing support out there from a mental health point of view. And I am so grateful, you know, I invested a year in my life of getting my mental health back on track. And it won't necessarily be that long or that short for everyone, but you know, that, that time invested at this point in my life means I've got hopefully 60-ish years left of leading a wonderful, happy life, you know, free of mental health issues. So, you know, if, if it's something there for you, delve into it, dive into it. It, it needs your attention and you're going to have a better life when you've resolved it. So I love quotes. I've done very well not to put any quotes up until this point, but I did want to leave you with a quote, which is, you must believe deep inside of you that you were born to do more than survive, make a living and die. You were created with a gift trapped inside of you. Your job is to find that gift and serve it to the world. Thank you so much for having me and best of luck. Mr. Greg Cross and Ms. Kate Morton, on behalf of Auckland Grammar School and St. Cuthbert's College, I would like to thank you for making yourselves available today. I know we speak on behalf of all our students today by saying that you've inspired us to plan our futures with excitement and curiosity. Your messaging around the future of the workforce, the importance of passion and mental health was invaluable. Before we close our formal presentations this afternoon, I would like to remind our parents and students of the key information regarding our 2021 Careers Evening, which is to be held at Auckland Grammar School. The Careers Evening is on Tuesday the 15th of June from 6pm till 9pm. A reminder to all students from Auckland Grammar and St Cuthbert's College that if you are attending this event, you are to be in full school uniform. We look forward to seeing you at the event. Bye, love, serve. Per Augusta, at Augusta.